I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we're looking at, is it fair to call Gu Cheng a misty poet? Is yes. That, is that okay? Yes. Okay. We're looking at Gu Cheng, um, who is a uh, writer in the 70s? Yes. Well, 70s and 80s, yes. Okay, fair enough. Rob, you wrote your master's thesis at Nankai Dashui in Chinese on Haizi, and much of the work you did touched on a lot of these poets who were his contemporaries, Gu Cheng being a mon- uh, amongst yeah. them. Tell me, tell me who Gu Cheng is. I, I, you know, I'm the the uneducated barbarian who knows very little about the misty poets. Uh, who is Gu Cheng? Why does he matter? This the poem. What introduce this this very 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 short poem? Yeah. So. Well, well, first with Gu Cheng. Gu Cheng was one of the key figures, really, in what's called misty or Menglong poetry. It's kind of a pejorative term. We mentioned that in another podcast. But uh, he was one of the other many writers who grew up during the Cultural Revolution. And his family was sent to rural Shandong. Uh, they became pig farmers during the Cultural Revolution. He claims to have learned poetry directly from nature. Of course, if you read a lot of it, you can see a lot of other influence as well. But anyway, uh, he's another one of those people that was associated with the Jin Tian or Today magazine that was being helmed at the time by Bei Dao and Meng Ke and some other luminaries. He made enough of a name for himself that he found a position teaching Chinese at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He has an awfully grim story because all of that sounds fairly straightforward even straight laced for this era except that in 1993 he attacked his wife with an axe and then hung himself so that's not your standard way to go and what is interesting to me about Gu Cheng is that his poetry at its best is I'm trying to think of a really simple way to describe it. It's almost it's almost peaceful or childlike mixed with deeply disturbing. And I, I know we bring out musical references all the time. I just can't help myself. That's just sort of how I work. I think of in terms of analogs. But there is a... Same. I know. There's a band called Animal Collective. I don't even know how many of you have heard of them, but... No one. They're one of my favorites, but their early stuff is a weird blend, almost lullaby or like nursery rhyme sounding kind of cadences and melodies with wacko industrial noise, just complete insanity with like da 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 coming over the top. It's very strange. Gu Chung at times sort of feels like that. You'll have what, what almost feels like a haiku-esque atmosphere, but if you read, there's just a kind of darkness running through it that kind of makes you shiver a little bit yeah shiver is the right word the poem that we're reading today you know i was i was thinking about finding a longer gu chung poem but really i i I can't think of a better example of gu chung's poetry than this and it's just called a generation rob this is a really short poem we both made attempts at translating it we're just going to share those translations is it okay if i go ahead and share mine first the dark night gave my eyes their blackness but i used them to find the brightness and mine is the dark night gave me my black eyes but i used them to seek the light it's a deceptively tricky turn of phrase, which is what I love about it. it there's, only, there's only two lines in the Chinese, and that's it. And yet, it's, it's just, they're superb. They're two superb lines of poetry because they're simple. Incredibly well-crafted. Incredibly well-crafted. It feels like something that could have come from the classics, but it's definitely not. It's, it's modern in spirit. No. It's so modern. The reason it's so tricky to translate, and I, I promise, dear listener, we're not going to bog you down in... in in uh, translation specifics because it's boring. Thank you. Yeah. But there's something that happens in the Chinese with two characters in particular that you can read them. It's, it's very tricky to do, I think, very well. And the Chinese is much, much better, but it wouldn't really help the non-Chinese speaking listener if we read it. So we're not going to. But 
The idea but we simply- will post our translations and the original on the website, right, yes. Rob? Yes, and those of you who maybe have more experience translating the Misty Poets can correct us as you wish. Now, when we say it's perfectly crafted, or I would say it's perfectly crafted, it's because it has everything you need to have in a, po- a much longer poem, but crammed into two lines, right? So one, the Misty Poets came out of the Cultural Revolution. There's a lot of poetry about the Cultural Revolution and about the scars that happened after it or because of it. That's wordier, that gets more into specifics. Gu Chang still manages to encapsulate that very briefly. So when he talks about the dark night and his dark eyes, there's a link. No matter whether you translate the darkness of my eyes or my dark eyes, they, both of those come from the dark night. Both use the Chinese character, he or he se, so black, the color black, right? They're both black. And well, actually, the, the night is he ye and the eyes are he se, but it's the same character, right? Now, the there's a lot of things you can do with that, right? But the, there's a contrast with the brightness, so I, I receive these black eyes, or the blackness of my eyes, but, there's the character Chu. but I'm using them to seek something different. It's, it's almost haiku in its kind of simplicity. Yes. Uh, it, it's so, it, there's so much encapsulated in that one word Chu, the but, the kind of reversal. Yes. At first you start out and you have this, Really, I mean, it's it's literally dark. Like the the word dark is used, or forms of darkness are used two or three times in this really short short line. I mean, he refers to the blackness of the night and both and and the blackness of his eyes, and and you know, in just eight characters or something like that. I, I'm not counting. Um, and, and it in such a short poem to have that first line be so dark on multiple levels. You described Rob his poetry as really grim. I think grim is the right word here, right? Like it's just it's kind of ooh. Um, you can see where this kind of axe murdering, uh, mental breakdown self is kind of struggling. But then it turns in that line one to line two. There is hope in that he's seeking out the brightness. I don't know if he ever finds it. I mean, he, he uses the verb. I think you translated it as to seek. I think I said something similar, but slightly different. But but there is this kind of, I'm going to use it, the word, a ray of hope, um, which is appropriate uh, an appropriate light metaphor or light motif uh, for for this poem. And depending on how you read this, there are... It's either a ray of hope or a ray of blackness. This is why it's such a compelling piece of writing. So in addition to this one character, Chu, which could be may, could be but or, or some version of a, of a conjunction like that, the, the part of this poem that kills me is in the Chinese, Yong Ta, to use it. So he has dark eyes that the dark night gave him. Now, someone coming out of the Cultural Revolution, you can, you can see that link directly. You can go, fair enough, he's seen horrible things. Uh, evil has happened, so maybe that's just colored the way he sees. Maybe he sees the whole world as dark and evil. That makes sense. Then he says, I'm using that to seek the light. How do you use broken eyes that are used to seeing nothing but night to seek something that's not that? Hang on, Rob. I, I've got to put something to you. So the word in Chinese, yong ta, or hmm. the two words, to use it, use it, um, that ta is the non-gendered pronoun. So do you think that's referring to the eyes or is he referring to the dark night? Because if, you, if you're, right? Like, because if, if you're interpreting, I think I think your interpretation of, of him talking about the cultural revolution in line one, which, you know, I mean, it's such a, it's such a short poem. There's no way you can pin any single interpretation down, but I, I think that's a fascinating way to look at it. But I, I think you can see Dark Knight possibly as a symbol for the Cultural Revolution. Or is that Ta? So that's one way to interpret what the pronoun Ta is referring to. Or is it his eyes? Yeah. Is it this kind of internalized subjectivity? Is it the dark, the darkness that he has internalized in his own body that he's actually going like, uh, you know, struggling, struggling with his own demons, which clearly... He had he some did. demons. That's a great point. I'm glad you pointed that out because yes, that you could read either one of those. And 
that's that is what Chinese poetry can do that I I don't know. I don't think you can do it the same way in English. I mean, we can have a debate about that. But anyway, regardless, Chinese poetry does so beautifully. Is you, if you if it's crafted well, the whole thing can pivot on a single sound, a single character. You can turn it this way and go, oh wow! So he's somehow mining the pathos and the and the tragedy of the Cultural Revolution to find hope, or spin it the other direction and say. Something in him, something in the darkness that's in him, he's going to use. One way or the other, he's using this thing to find something that's not this thing. And does that mean, you mentioned a ray of hope earlier, does that mean he sees some kind of redemption in store for him, for his generation? Or because he's using something deeply flawed, does it mean he's never actually going to find it? Because bear in mind, you know, the, in the Chinese, it doesn't say he's going to find it. It just says he's going to look for it. How do you read that? I read it kind of like I read the the Heitze poem, Rob. The Heitze is, you're the expert on Heitze. So I'm I'm here, you know, as a, as a lowly, lowly, know-nothing idiot. I already uh, knew that, though, the, so that's cool. In the face of an expert. But I, I, I kind of feel like this is very similar to uh, the, the Heitze poem, Mian Chao Da Hai, Chun Nuan Hua Kai. How do you translate that? Like facing the great ocean, the flowers are, are blooming, something like that? Yeah. Um, that poem is anthologized endlessly, and, and pretty much every Chinese person who goes through high school now is forced to to encounter that poem, at least probably memorize it in high school, uh, I- at least in the PRC. And it's oftentimes presented as a really positive poem. But of course, Heidze killed himself shortly after pinning right. that poem. So I, I see Gu Cheng and Heidze's poems as maybe in some sort of dialogue. Yeah. Uh, you know, Heidze's poem appears to be positive, but it's clearly got a negative undertone that that in interpreting his life, you can see it in a very different light. Gu Cheng's poem, it, it has, I, I think it's mostly, it has a negative tone. There is a mm. possible reading of it as a super positive thing. But again, his the course of his life militates against that interpretation, that positive interpretation. And and just like Heidze, it's a good reference, just like Heidze, it depends which side you're looking at. So Heidze's poem talks about gazing out at the ocean you know, towards the the distant the distance, basically the distant shore. I'm not going to pull it up right now, but one of the things I always find fascinating about that poem is people assume that he's looking at the ocean, our ocean, from this side of our existence, our life. But Heidze was a deeply mystical poet, and it's equally probable that he was looking, he was imagining himself looking back towards us from across an ocean that we might think of as death. So he might already be envisioning killing himself and imagining looking back towards us. And there's enough ambiguity in his language to make that possible. And here, you know, we, we talked about the the non-gendered pronoun ta. What about wo? Who's I here? The title of this poem is I dai, is, uh, hang on, is I dai ren, like a generation, like a person of a generation, this generation's people. So wo, the I here, could be just about anybody too, right? It could be all people from his generation. It could just be him as a member of the generation. There's just, there's so many ways to take it. And it's it's a similar it's a similar deal, right? Like, which side do you want to look at? Do you want to look at the political side where all the people broken by the Cultural Revolution are looking for hope? Or is it something very different? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I think we've discussed this poem this short two-line poem for way longer than i thought it was possible to discuss is there any takeaway from this poem that you have if if you wanted to leave the listener with a thought about this poem what would it be it's that this is for me the kernel of why i read modern chinese poetry over even the classical because at its best it combines some of the pithiness and the ambiguity of classical poetry with some of the sort of dark weirdness of modern poetry. It's like if you could somehow bring together Li Bai and, I don't know, Kafka or something. That's sort of how I read a lot of the <laughs> misty poets. And It's an even, interesting marriage. I know. I, can't, I wish they, I could read something that really was that. But 
it, you know, and so sometimes they can be sort of playful, like Monka has a has a more playful side. But yeah, I, you could do. There's this Gu Chang is a fantastic way to get into this stuff. And this one poem, I mean, goodness, we haven't even we could still talk about. It. There's other stuff I had thought about mentioning, and I'm not even going to bring up because yeah, we're we're <laughs> we're running pretty long here on just this one short poem. But that's a mark of just how good it is. I I still disagree with you, Rob. I don't think that the modern poets have have touched Tang and Song poetry. But I think in poems like this, they come as close as I've seen to doing it. You have this kind of succinctness, this brevity of language that communicates so much in such a small space that I, I'm I'm stunned. I, I agree with you, Rob. I don't know if you could do the same thing in English. My last, my very final thought, and this isn't uh, the opening of a debate, it's just a maybe kind of a corrective. I, I think it's incorrect to compare Tang poetry with this stuff in the same way that it's like saying, well, Shakespeare's sonnets are so much better than what T.S. Eliot wrote. There's such different kinds of writing that to talk as though someone like Gu Chung is trying to get to Li Bai and just really can't is reductive because they're extremely different traditions. Where I see there's, there's a connecting bridge, but I still think you're looking at two very, very different kinds of writing. Maybe, but I just want to point out, you may have a problem with me comparing uh, Gu Cheng with Li Bai, but you didn't say anything about me comparing English and Chinese, which obviously those poetic traditions are even more different. So, you know, like, sure, like they are different. Gu Cheng is, is writing in a very different way from Li Bai, and he's not trying to be Li Bai. But Shakespeare wasn't trying to be Li Bai either, but we can still compare them. Uh, in fact, there's actually, I don't know if you know this, Rob, there's a whole discipline in universities called comparative literature where they're, <laughs> they're theoretically supposed to do that. <laughs> well, the, the final thing I would say is that, yes, but we're not making a qualitative comparison like you just were, which is that clearly the Tong is superior. I think we can agree on that. What I'm saying is they're different. And yeah, you absolutely. If we wanted to compare Li Bai and Gu Chang, that'd be fascinating. But I'm not doing that in order to say this one is clearly superior to that one. I'm saying they're very different and we can benefit a lot by comparing them. But saying this one thing is what all these writers are striving for is I would I would disagree. But in paying attention to any of them, we we inherently give them value, right? Like personally, we don't yes. we don't read the crappy tongue poets because they're crappy. We only want to we want to spend time on good stuff. So inherently, we are we are uh, valorizing. Yeah, you these can't different not make value poets. judgments, but they're personal. I mean, I prefer sure. this stuff, and I always will. And you prefer the tongue stuff, and you always will. But there is a sort of democratic nature to this, if. Everybody prefers the Tang poets to the modern poets. Then that says something. Not necessarily that one is better than the other, but it, at at least if there is a better one, the 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 ancients get it. You're opening a much bigger debate, my friend. I was about to say you're opening a much bigger debate, my friend. We should end right now. <laughs> I'm going to cut you off, and Thank we'll you. have that debate some other time. <laughs> Because <laughs> this podcast has already gone on. We tried to end it like five minutes ago, didn't we? Yeah, and then, then, then we started talking about this. And, it, you know, dear listeners, I should say, listen, Train you're wreck. really, really lucky that we're cutting it off here. This could turn into an hour-long just grudge match march through the swamps with us into the bowels of, of academic study of Chinese literature and poetry. But we're not going to do that because we like you. We can do a Joe Rogan two and a half hour long podcast on that that debate <laughs> and maybe maybe if dear listener if you if you stop listening to our podcast or something we will just to entertain ourselves but for now because we like you and respect you we're gonna cut ourselves off here i'm lee moore i'm rob moore and this is the chinese literature podcast <laughs>